This is a mechanism of disease map for polycystic ovarian syndrome, also called PCOS. I'll be talking about the etiology of PCOS, the pathophysiology of PCOS, as well as how PCOS manifests in the clinical findings. This one's a bit tricky because the etiology and pathophysiology of polycystic ovarian syndrome is not completely understood. So I'll be talking about what we know so far and some of the key trends that we've been able to identify in terms of what causes this disease. Now, each of these bubbles are color-coded according to the core concepts in this legend up here. And if you wanna take a screenshot, go ahead and do that now. I'll be clearing each of these items and talking through them one by one. So first, let's talk about three main hormone changes that are involved in the pathophysiology of polycystic ovarian syndrome. First, these people tend to have hyperinsulinemia, that's high insulin in the blood, and that usually comes along with a peripheral insulin resistance. This is the same pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes, so oftentimes those diseases coincide. But hyperinsulinemia has been associated in a pretty good correlation with PCOS. In addition, the patients tend to have hyperandrogenism, that's high levels of testosterone and other precursors to testosterone, and that's called functional ovarian hyperandrogenism. Lastly, there's high luteinizing hormone, that's high LH, and that's produced by the pituitary as well. Now, these three findings are all, um, they all happen, and they're all kind of interrelated with each other. For instance, hyperinsulinemia can lead to hyperandrogenism, and both of them can cause the premature luteinization of the granulosa cells in the ovary, which in turn increases the LH hormone produced by the pituitary. Luteinizing hormone in return stimulates theca cells, which can produce testosterone and other androgens, kind of leading back to that hyperandrogenism. Now, a couple words on the etiology, on what causes these hormone changes, this hormone imbalance. As I mentioned earlier, hyperinsulinemia is related to type 2 diabetes, and it's related to metabolic syndrome in general. So obesity, type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, all of those predispose you to having hyperinsulinemia. And of course, the cause of metabolic syndrome is partially genetic, but also partially lifestyle. So lack of exercise, sedentary lifestyle, eating poorly, um, consuming more calories than you burn can all predispose you to metabolic syndrome. There's a bit of a vicious cycle here because insulin itself is an anabolic hormone and it results in fat accumulation, which kind of worsens the obesity and the metabolic syndrome. So there's a bit of a cycle going on here as well. Now, it wouldn't be true to say that everybody who has PCOS has metabolic syndrome, has obesity, has type 2 diabetes. 10 to 20% of people with PCOS do not have um, type 2 diabetes, do not have this high insulin state. And there are some unknown intrinsic ovarian factors that can predispose you to this cycle here, that can lead to the premature luteinization of the granulosa cells. We don't know exactly what causes that. There does seem to be some genetic predisposition, and there are some hereditary correlations there. These are some of the common genes that have been found in the studies. That's AMH, AMHR, GNAS1, DENNDA, D1A. Um, and those are some of the genes that come up in the most recent studies of the etiology of PCOS. In addition to the hormone changes that I have listed here, these hormone changes cause other hormones to change throughout the body. So let's talk about that. Oh, real quick, of course, there's a genetic predisposition to metabolic syndrome as well. As I was saying, these hormone changes can lead to other hormone changes throughout the body. For instance, when you have luteinization of the granulosa cells, those also produce estrogens. So estradiol and some of the other estrogens are higher in people with PCOS. In addition, hyper hyperinsulinemia leads to a low uh, amount of sex hormone binding globulin. So insulin levels and sex hormone binding globulin levels are inversely related in the blood. When sex hormone binding globulins are, lo are low, that means that estrogens and androgens tend to have less globulin to bind to. So that kind of predisposes you to higher estrogen levels and higher androgen levels as well. So high insulin, low sex hormone binding globulin, high androgens and high estrogens. Fat accumulation also tends to increase your estrogen levels. That's because there's peripheral production of estrogens in your adipose tissue. So that explains this connection here. Estrogens themselves have feedback on the pituitary gland and reduce your follicle stimulating hormone. 
And because you have high LH and low FSH, you have a disrupted LH-FSH balance, and that'll lead to some of the manifestations. So now, the main manifestation that you have for PCOS is menstrual irregularities, and that's related to this disrupted LH-FSH balance, as well as the hyperandrogenism that you have. The menstrual irregularities can vary. You can have primary or secondary amenorrhea. So primary amenorrhea would be a woman who never gets her period at all. Secondary amenorrhea would be a woman who had normal periods, but then no longer has them. They become irregular or they stop completely. Oligomenorrhea is when you have periods that are less frequent than usual. And these women can also have menorrhagia in addition to all of this. So menstrual irregularities are probably the most common presenting symptom for PCOS. There are a number of symptoms related to high androgens, to high testosterone in the body. This includes oily skin, acne vulgaris, androgenic alopecia, which is essentially male-patterned hair loss, male-patterned balding, and hirsutism. Hirsutism is when you have hair on the, on the chin, on the upper lip, um, kind of in male patterns, on the chest, on the abdomen, on the back, and on the buttocks. The high insulin state also causes a manifestation. When you have high insulin, you will also have high insulin-like growth factor 1, and this stimulates keratinocyte and dermal fibroblast proliferation which result in epidermal hyperplasia and hyperpigmentation. The end result here is that you'll have acanthosis nigricans, which are kind of these patches of dark skin that you tend to see in people with type 2 diabetes that's uncontrolled, and also in people with PCOS in some cases. So skin hyperplasia and skin hyperpigmentation, so extra darkening, thick patches of skin, acanthosis nigricans. The LH-FSH balance is also relevant to fertility and ovulation. So because your LH is much higher than your FSH, you'll have impaired follicle maturation with cyst formation due to lack of follicle rupture. This can also affect your menstrual cycle, but um, I guess more prominently here, it results in oligoovulation, or you're ovulating less than you're supposed to, or in some cases not ovulating at all, anovulation. And this is what causes the infertility in PCOS. In addition, when you have high estrogen state and low ovulation cycles or infrequent ovulation, you'll tend to have endometrial hyperplasia. That's the inner lining of your uterus that is kind of bigger than it's supposed to be, growing more than it's supposed to be. And that's because you're not having ovulation, which triggers your period, which is the shedding of the endometrium. So this high estrogen state and this low ovulation state leads to an overgrowth of the inner lining of your endometrium, uh, of, your, of, of your uterus. That actually increases your risk of endometrial cancer. So when you have that endometrium that's growing more than it should be, not shedding as much as it should be, that can predispose you to endometrial cancer in PCOS. There are some other manifestations that are associated with type 2 diabetes, with metabolic syndrome, and with fat accumulation. That's um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as well as sleep apnea, and those can present um, and PCOS as well. There are also some nonspecific symptoms related to all of the other symptoms here. Um, psych disorders like depression and anxiety disorders are related in PCOS as well. Lastly, a quick note on the pathology findings in PCOS. On, growth, on gross pathology, you'll have brown, small, uniform cysts in a circular pattern around the subscapular region of the ovary. And on histopathology, when you look under the microscope, you'll see ovarian hypertrophy, a thick capsule, enlarged cystic fo uh, follicles, stromal hyperplasia and fibrosis, and hyperluteinized theca cells with smaller granulosa cells. So it kind of matches the, uh, the disrupted LH-FSH balance here. You'll have hyperluteinized theca cell and smaller granulosa cells. So this was just a quick overview of PCOS. Unfortunately, this mechanism of disease flow chart isn't that great because we don't uh, very well understand the exact pathophysiology of the disease. And it's very likely that it's a, some combination of the things here. We have yet to elucidate the exact pathophysiology as well as um, the exact predicting etiologies here. I hope this was helpful and thank you for listening.